Yeah, no, 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 don't, don't worry. worry. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yes. Sh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm. I don't know what to put. Ah, can we use this? What's the developer side, and which one is the? The uh, developer the side is the dark one. Of okay, so dark one is the developer. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. The one with the monsters. Uh, <laughs> and the uh, the white ones are the designers. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm gonna take one too. Mom. Okay. So don't forget how it's important. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, just I want to introduce the the interaction part. Okay. So we will have some introductory questions just to to know the audience, and you can use the the short link if you want to vote from your phone, or you can scan it with the QR code. And uh, it's it's important to know from the room. Um, how many designers there are and how many developers there are to, to know the representative. And while you do this uh, and uh, uh, get the survey, we're going to introduce ourselves. So uh, my name is Ekaterina Moraru, and I'm an interaction designer for about 10 years for an open source project, uh, which is XWiki. Okay, and I'm going to pass this. Should I have to introduce myself? Yes. Hi, so I'm Timon. Uh, I'm actually in, like, computer games mostly right now. But before that, I did some work for iOS as well. That was more, I was a programmer, but you know, there's a little bit of design in all programming work, so. <laughs> nice. I'm Belen, I am an interaction designer and design researcher. I've been doing this for over a decade now, and I've been contributing to um, free software for about seven years now. I'm Jan, I'm also an interaction designer, mostly on uh, Nextcloud and uh, also some other smaller open source projects. Yeah. Hi, I'm Donald Abrams. Uh, past 18 months I've been, I worked in Vision on Studio, doing the animation tools. Uh, right now I'm working for the OCaml Foundation as community manager. Yes, this, this is going to be the hardest part, <laughs> moving the microphone. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to update this. Okay, okay. So we have like 14 developers, six designers, and uh, some other people, which is interesting because it's interesting. <laughs> Being a designer room, we have some good representations, just shy developers that uh, will vote mostly from their phones. Mom. Okay, uh, the next question is if you have a designer in your project community and uh, I would like maybe the panel members to say if they have multiple designers in their community uh, and if they work for multiple communities. Hmm? Uh, well, so uh, like I said, I'm mostly on the corporate side, kind of computer games are proprietary so I can save much for open source. Mm, uh, and most of the projects, open source projects I'm involved in no, no designers. Okay. Mostly because it's like the graphics kind of things. Uh, so, uh, but at, at, our co at our company, basically everybody's responsible for his, uh, like we have ma ma maestros. So if you're, a, 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 like if you're a, the sound guy, you're the sound guy. You do everything that is sound related. And you have to work with other people to make all of that work, but there's no you know, person who's, who's responsible for the design. On the UI side even, uh, we very often have people responsible for certain parts of the UI, but there's not always necessarily a person who is responsible for designing all of the UI and then a separate person responsible for uh, making the UI. Usually it's kind of connected because we have a small team. In every single open source project I've contributed to, I've been the only designer. Um, yeah, in, I would say in every open source project I'm in, I'm the only like designer with a design education or a design studies background, so to say. But there's a bunch of front end people, or even like I would say more and more front end people who are also more and more design minded, which is good to see, of course. Or yeah, developers who also get more and more design minded. At Envision, we definitely had a lot of designers on staff because, but it's interesting, they're designing for designers. 
Um, and they had a lot of power. They were basically treated like product owners to a large degree. And then at OCaml Foundation, we very, very small. So we're contracting our design right now for the bits that we need it. And we're looking at what more we need. Okay, and for, for my case, in Xwiki, for the past 10 years, I've been the only designer too. So that's why we actually we did this community in order to not be alone anymore and to, to get feedback. Um, okay, let's see what the, uh, the project says. Okay, so this is quite equilibrated. I'm curious to see uh, if we will ever do a panel, if this uh, changes over time and if we have more, more designers involved. Okay, uh, the next question is... Um, what communities do you think they need designers? And um, okay, are they small, medium, popular, or they're, they're optional? We are small, and okay, so I guess small, like what? twelve people. Okay. Uh, what I would say is in our company, and our general idea is that we just don't have the resources to have a specific designer. Not so much because uh, rather, a person who's designing is not doing work in a way. Um, not, not really, but the problem is that also creates more work in the sense of like more overhead to get a result. Whereas if you just have a programmer doing the programming and he just says, oh, I'm going to do this and then just does it, that's very quick. So we have a very short uh, iteration process because of that. Whereas when you're designing, you have to first design, you have to think of all of the use cases, you have to uh, then implement them and the end result probably will be much better, but it takes longer to get there. Well, in my case, I've worked in both streams. I contributed to the Yocto project, which is a Linux Foundation initiative, um, and it was a massive project. I was still the only designer. And in that case, designer was considered optional, right? I was disposable. Um, but I also worked in a one-man band, like the video, um, the video program that they use here at Fosdem to process all the talks. Um, and that's a one-person project. And um, in that case, um, I felt very much valued and, uh, you know, that he was really appreciated my work, the maintainer. So I think, I'm not sure his size what is the factor here. Yeah, I guess the, the most true answer, I guess, that most people unfortunately would give is D, but what is the correct answer is A. So, um, the, the, especially because a lot of proprietary projects or Silicon Valley projects or whatever are co-founded or led by designers, which unfortunately brings us in a tight spot because we have to co uh, compete with that, basically. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's very important that we look at this A, not just as like, a, oh, we have so few resources, and I hope that the jobs board of open source design can help with that to, to yeah, solve these small tasks or do it in small steps. So I have a more nuanced thought on this. Uh, so design is kind of an overloaded term. A lot of times the degree programs are called visual communications for a reason because it's another form of communication. So really, you bring a designer in once it surpasses your average person's ability to communicate what's happening. So if you're doing like a blockchain startup and it's a small people, those things are very, very difficult to both communicate and understand, and they're going to need a designer much earlier than something that's more well understood by the people you're, you're communicating to. So again, it's, it doesn't really, it's the size of the project, it's more about the complexity of what you need to communicate, because you need an expert that knows how to whittle it down and balance both copy and, and visual design. Or, or interactive design in a lot of your cases. Yes, yes. Uh, so the results are uh, okay, medium projects. So people maybe consider that you need to be a sizable team in order to need someone dedicated for this kind of work. Maybe there are also financial reasons for this uh, voting. Okay, this is more like a marketing slide, <laughs> but, but the idea is if you are looking for a designer as an open source contributor, where would you go to, to look for one? And uh, the option D is like uh, our open source uh, design job board where, where we try to, to bridge the gap. But uh, yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything <laughs> besides this. And I don't know how many uh, had the time to 
to to vote to vote, but the majority say other. I'm curious what that other means, but uh, and maybe I have some bugs in the. Okay, so we'll see. people who voted other. What, what where you go looking? Friends. 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 Okay. Okay. Okay, so this means just paid uh, paid designers, not necessarily somebody that could uh, volunteer and do it for free. Okay, and the question is, what kind of designer do you need for your project? And this would be interesting to know how you vote, because um, there's also lack of education in the, the vast uh, areas of design, and I don't know when people are looking for a designer, if they know exactly what they want, and designers expect you to have the, the jargon and know exactly what you're requesting. Do you have any <laughs> remarks about this? I, I guess the, the issue is, and maybe Belen can, or Bernard also can say more about this, but I guess that user researcher, for example, is not going to be really answered by anyone or, or it's not really something that you think about because it's not something that you see that you think that you need. Whereas graphic designer, if you say, oh, we need a logo or we need some illustrations, yeah, that's obvious. But it's not obvious that you need a user researcher or a usability engineer. Also very quickly mentioned that these are roles, not people. I do several of those things, for example. So these are roles, not much directly to people necessarily. Mm. And another issue is that I put there the front-end developer and uh, in a lot of communities they expect someone to do also do the implementation but in our community we usually uh, we don't know to do that part and also uh, the um, projects are very diverse and in a lot of languages so we, we might not feel that, um, that need. And I'm curious what people said. Okay, so there are eight people that said uh, uh, that they don't know. Question there? Yes. Wait. <laughs> yeah, uh, so my question is, since I answered I don't know, uh, it's partly because I'm not sure what, what's the difference between some of those roles. Could you explain what's the difference between interaction designer, usability engineer, and UX designer? I want to explain this. <laughs> 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 They're kind of the same. I, I can try. It, a lot of it has to do with where in the funnel it is. Uh, and so you have people that are trying to find out more about your users, which are your researchers, um, all the way, and there's a different piece of the funnel all the way down to the front end developer, which is actually making it real. And there's different specialties that are broken down inside. I actually don't know of any good resources on that explain the difference between each one. And actually, there's a lot of arguments in the design community. What, when you're putting out for a role, uh, what do you title it? Because these things are all very different. <laughs> I'm going to be fairly brutal in here. I'm going to say that out of all those things, a graphic designer tends to be a different person. A front-end developer tends to be a different person. Everything else is, what, what did you call it? Uh, slang. Yeah, they are pretty much the same thing. Um, but we are an industry, I think, that tend to make, fun, make up fancy words. I'd argue about user research being yeah. very separate as well. Actually, I think it's a, it's a core element of the interaction design discipline. Um, so The statistics and the math part? The statistics and the math part? Well, <laughs> um, actually, usability engineers very often will not do statistically significant studies anyway, so. It also depends on, on the person. So some are more generalist, generalist and they, as Balen said, they want to do all, but some, they are specialized and they, I don't know, they do just accessibility or, uh, yeah. Okay. Bon. Uh, and the next question is, for how long would you need a designer? And the options are one-time, periodic, full-time, and issue-based. And this is important when the, you want to contribute with, uh, collaborate with somebody, because that person might have a uh, limited time, or uh, if you want them to stay like a couple of years, you might need to fund them in some ways. Any remarks? So 
Actually, for, for me right now, I actually need a one time, but very specifically, I, I want it delivered with a small design system. So when they're putting together pieces, allow me to sort of remix it um, with some guidelines, and that enables me to not need necessarily need the, peri the periodic. I think that's super important. You have been 10 years in XWiki. Yes. I was five years in Yocto Project. I think establishing long-term collaborations is actually key. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, it's not going to be very efficient. But the work you do, the amount of interaction you have to do to get into the project, you do kind of have to understand it first before you can actually do any work. And also depends on the project. I mean, it's a platform and it's very complex and you still have work to do for a longer period of time. But if it's just a logo design, you cannot well, stay for, for a long time. You just crowd the logo. Yeah, yeah, no, sure, but... Okay. There's a question? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I'm one of the other people, so not a designer, I'm a theatre director. And I wanted to make a short statement on the political task of open source design because for me we were four people working together from the beginning, two people more coming from design side and two developers. And I think in, in a lot of software the mainstream people are using what they see is very different to what's happening on the technical side. And I think for me it's a really, really in political issue to create design, to create a design that enlightens people about how, how the architecture is working actually because we need to make more people aware of how technical stuff is happening and it is, it is like mostly a design issue and that's like, that's really a statement so please like talk from the beginning on, get people in there and I didn't know anything about the developing process and I had to learn a lot but then we had like big discussions and I said like no I don't want to have hierarchical software architecture and then there were a lot of good ideas because we started in the beginning and that's like I think the political issue that's really unclear for a lot of people that there's like an enlightenment uh, that can happen so people can understand how things are working if it's like more transparent to the architecture. Cool. Thanks. Okay, and um, this question asks, does your community list the design contribution rules? Do you want to, to comment something about the options? No? So we have options like the design issues list. How many of you do you have this? I mean, I will see <laughs> when the results are come, but it's very important to to showcase and list them in the issue tracker is the most easiest because every developer you are using them constantly. But if you as a, as, a, as, a, as a designer come into a community and you don't know exactly what is needed, uh, there's no way to find it. Uh, yeah, so what what is often missing, I guess, in projects is a or what is often there in projects, in open source projects, is some kind of contribution page. So how to get involved as a developer, as a translator, um, whatever else, as a, as a writer or something, or marketing. But um, what is often missing is design. Even if it's there, it's mostly maybe just a link or something. Um, and what would be really good is to have a, some kind of dedicated, like, slash design page for a project where you really have, like, specific, yeah, things like, like, almost everything like that, like design issues list, dis decision makers, uh, feedback conduct, deliverables, communication channels. Um, and yeah, w this is also something that we should maybe list or review on other projects where we say, hey, um, we, we pri primar or prioritize projects which actually have a page like that and allow people to be onboarded or make it easier for people to onboard themselves. I was actually kind of interested to hear more about how do you guys usually keep the documentation for design? Because the format in which you keep the documentation will, I think, decide a lot how you can, how people can contribute, right? So, any thoughts? 
Yeah, so just coming out of the industry, there's a lot of work on design systems and being able to sort of hand them off. And I think it's still rel relatively in its infancy. Uh, we have like three or four big competitors, but in terms of if we don't have a standard deliverable format, I think we have a principle behind it, which is like the Brad Frost and atomic design for web and app, but that, that doesn't even really touch interactive that, mo that well. So it's, it's, it's happening, but I think it's still in its infancy. So like handing it off as a deliverable, I, we're just not there yet. Them, it's more usually just text, design documents, basically. Okay. If you hand off a DSM system, but then you're locking them into the system. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, the next question is that if you think that money is a factor for limited contribution in OS, and uh, there was also a tweet that uh, somebody said that uh, most designers aren't compensated at a level that contrib uh, encourages contributions, and I'm just going to update to see what you said, and it's true. Does anyone want to comment about money? I mean, it's a, it's a distinct uh, and delicate topic, but I wanted to slide about it because <laughs> maybe you have different opinions. Hi, my name is Dave Crossland, and I've worked for uh, many years on LibreFonts. Uh, type, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I'm Dave Crossland. I worked for many years on LibreFonts and uh, LibreFont design. Typeface design is a very specialist area of you know design, graphic design in general. It requires a long time to practice to be able to do it well, and often people have to invest tens of thousands of euros in you know in university courses to, to get to that level. And they, um, yeah, they, they, they're uh, very often very against the idea that they would give away work that they worked for months or years on full time. Um, nevertheless, um, there are a lot of Libra fonts uh, which are out there, um, not only from Google but also from other companies, where they've seen that it's more valuable for them to make the font available under a Libra license than to restrict it. Um, and so I, I think that. Um, the tweet is, is interesting that most designers are not compensated at a general level compared to software engineers. Um, but um, a lot of designers are working in very small studios or freelance compared to software engineers. And that um, if you understand the business value propositions of free licensing, then potentially you can earn good money doing open design. Uh, the next question? No? Yes. So, so this is a double session, so please relax. <laughs> because I have like 10 more questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question is if you think that the university or industry influences the tools and format that designers use. And if you want to say something about that, yeah. Absolutely. Working at Envision, we definitely worked very strongly with a lot of those programs to seed it in early. Uh, the Adobe, everyone has a student license for a reason. It's to get to lock them in early. Um, and it's just a great way to get Mindshare super early. Yeah, I was just recently at a design university um, and it was yeah a bit uh, strange how the students are like yeah all the hot shit like oh did you hear about framer and blah blah, blah. i mean envision and and figma and whatever that's already old uh, and 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 the, the new stuff is like yeah always the always the latest things and uh, so it's yeah okay so you learn a new tool like every year or whatever and um, it's i mean i would say it definitely influences it um i would also say it's a pity that that necessarily happens, uh, yeah. That there's no kind of standard that that stays there because I personally think that pen and paper is still, uh, or or, or a whiteboard or something, is really valuable tool also for collaboration. The standards on pen and paper. <laughs> um, I'm gonna blame the universities in here. Like I'm a PhD candidate in the design school at Northumbria University, and basically what they provide to their students is Adobe stuff. I think they, something needs to change in the mindset of educators as well, um, but I don't know how that's going to happen. <laughs>
And there were, uh, was also a case when uh, somebody requested a design and the contributor gave them a sketch file and the developer said, I cannot see that, I don't have the tools, so what are you going to do? And using open formats like uh, SVGs and exporting them, it's, it should be easy for, for everyone. Okay, so um, the next question is, do you need to be a user first in order to contribute? Anyone has an opinion on this? So, so let's see some results. Okay, they're kind of the equal. No, no. So, um, so I have a, I have a tweet. <laughs> um, it says that pre pretty much all uh, open source uh, contributors start out as users, which limit the number of projects that a designer might be reasonable expected to want to contribute to. I mean, if let's say a uh, designer might use the tools, they might want to contribute to GIMP or Inkscape, but besides this, uh, they would need to contribute to projects that they haven't used before. So I work a bit with both with design and development. So what, okay. I work with a little bit of both. De is this working? Okay. So uh, I work with a bit of both design and development. But so the question is like, how do designers actually pick projects that they would like to work on? Because like as a developer, it's either your skill set or like a project that you're attached to, but then you're attached to the project there, not the skill set. Like it's either of those. So how do like designers go about building their preferences? Okay, so as Jan said, maybe they will pick a project because it has that list of design issues or they have a, a readme and it will be easy for them to, to job on board. Otherwise, I don't know, maybe it's money if that project can propose some. Um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that you have to be a user first. It's always good to be a user, but as a designer you should have some sort of um, ability to step into people's shoes, um, which is a quality that you should have as a designer, um, or do research and f really find out what, what the users uh, do. Oftentimes, being a user uh, doesn't help, but is actually um, counterproductive because you're, you're too much actually in your own workflows and think too much about the way you uh, use the software yourself. So sometimes it really helps to step a long way back. I mean, I often do that also with the project that I work on and really helps after like one week of really not looking at it at all. Then you're like, oh, this is absolute bullshit and then you change it. So that really helps. Yeah, I think uh, it doesn't really matter that much if you are a user first, but I think you definitely need to need to become a user afterwards. So once you get involved and you start contributing, you have to understand the software and it's important that you use it as well. I just think it's really important to balance the needs of like a first time early user and a power user. The people that come in as a user first and they're sort of optimizing their experiences are really designing for a power user in case and requires expertise to step back and really sit there and design for the first time user. Um, and we, we did two, we had two, in Vision we had two different cycles for this. We had internal tickets that we would generate because we would use it for our own stuff. And then we'd have the external ones when we would go and talk to new users or, or people are using out in industry. And that, that having the two cycles really helped. Also, if you spend a lot of time uh, designing a project, uh, you will need to do usability tests to see the, how first interactions do. So you cannot do it yourself, but you need <laughs> users at least to do it. Okay, so the next question is, do designers need to learn Git? And Belen, do you have something to say? <laughs> you don't know Git? <laughs> So um, I, I was at this at this university, uh, as I said, and uh, uh, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so feel feel free to uh, punch me, but uh, no, they they should not. Um, I mean, I I do know Git, and I would say it's 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 uh, uh, good probably, but it shouldn't be. Um, and uh, like it starts at the level because those students, for example, I uh, showed them uh, GitHub Desktop, for example, which is a non-terminal interface for Git. Uh, but still, the design itself and the wording, like clone, push, and pull, is totally bonkers. Like uh, it should be first of all, it should be automatic, or it should be called upload, download. It should be called save or something like that. 
It's like these basic things you kind of expect, you know? Yeah. Um, um, from, uh, from the developer here, I'm going to say that developers need to learn how to use Git first. Um, we all have a ton of problems, whether it be small merge commits, like uh, conflict resolution, like we don't know how to do it. Uh, that's why Beyond Compare charges 100 bucks to, to get a license is because it's hard. Um, there are a bunch of um, design uh, version control systems currently being developed. Um, Avacode, I think, is one of them. There's a bunch of others. It's a different system um, in terms of you have people you do these things visually, and it's a lot of times. There's also different um, version control for copies in terms of going through approval processes and different pieces. It's a different system than code. No, I don't think they should learn how to use Git unless they're expected to be coding HTML along with you all. In that case, going to have to learn to use one of the GUIs, hopefully. <laughs> That's well designed. Well, I did want to say, yeah, of course, Git is like the basis of everything, and you have to learn it. Yeah, how are you going to cooperate with developer? No, no, that's. I mean, it, it it depends on the format in which you have your data. It's true that if it, if it's more graphical, if it's more like a wiki style thing where you need to uh, make comments for things, Git just wouldn't make sense. The merge conflicts would be horrible. Um, on the other hand, so for example, Git design-wise. Is the problem with it is that it's very poorly explained to people, but it's actually very easy. You just have to think of a tree of patches. It's just a tree of patches, and then all of the commands modify that tree, and then it's simple, really. Can I say something no, I very quickly? <laughs> I don't think they have to, but they definitely should. Git is an amazing tool, and um, it's also because when you're, for me, what happened was that when I learned Git, I wasn't really learning about Git. I wasn't even learning about version control. I was learning about design as my design material. And that was really powerful. So I think they should. They don't have to, though. And there's also a tweet at the bottom who says that most open source development uh, happens on GitHub, and it should be great to see that platform expands to support designs. Uh, my, my, uh, my question is... Um, um, so, many people here answer a true designer de needs to learn Git. Uh, I would like to ask why uh, designers need to learn Git. I understand that they have to understand the versioning system, and but um, why does it uh, enhance the collaboration between designer and developers? So it's a question for developers. Yes, because. Maybe the, uh, when we create a project with uh, image, icon, icon with a different size, uh, if you can't modify it, uh, it has to be the developer to modify this. It will be more comfortable for the, dev the designer to modify. So you're saying it's going to be faster if a designer does yes. it, okay? Sorry, thank you. Uh, just, uh, I wanted to say a quick note about this, and I think that this is two questions implicitly into one. One is whether we use Git as a specific set of technologies to do version control, and if designers should use that specific tool. And another one that is very different and is being answered as well is whether there should be some version control for the, over the design so that we can track back to changes and relate to that as different user experiences. And I think. Uh, that may shed some light on, on, on this. So on the technology side, we have a law called Conway's Law that we use for domain-driven design. It's uh, basically your, your system ends up looking like your communication structure. And so the question is, is how are you communicating between your designer and your developer? If that, if that communication is happening with HTML and CSS, then, and that, that needs to get feature branches and so on, then they need to learn Git because that's how they need to collaborate. And I've had that at places I've worked, such as Craftsy, um, Envision, so on. But if your handoff point is further off where your front-end developers are expected to take changes in mock-ups and get updates and then turn that in HTML, CSS, and that's your handoff point, then no, they don't need to learn it. So it really depends on where, how your, what your communication substrate is um, and how you design your organization. 
Stitt's uh, remark, and it says that design is not perceived as valuable as code. And uh, people said 13 votes for true and 9 for false. Any comments on that? <laughs> if not, we go to the next question. <laughs> Straight up comment. Uh, if you have an ugly design, people are going to tell you about it much faster than that ugly hack you just wrote. <laughs> <laughs> kind of depends on who looks at your code, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you c I guess it can some often be perceived, but then you use some crappy software and you immediately appreciate the value of good design. Thank you. I have a bit of a side question for the panel on this, and it may have something to do with the answers to this question. Where do you believe the ideation process fits into the software development life cycle? And that's a question across the board, because I think that might answer a lot of the reason why we think that's not maybe true. So what exactly do you mean? Where, when should we start the design? Or where, where does design fit within that process? Okay. Because if the primary is the software development life cycle, where does the design, and design is a cycle, not just as a single plane in and out, where does that fit into the overall work? And if I say like uh, it's in the beginning and then you just repeat? Uh, I, that's what I, I Okay. <laughs> so that would be my answer, but... Uh, I mean, the answer by the book, of course, is at the very beginning. Um, but who does that, you know? Like, or where does that happen in practice? Is the is the, especially in open source software, um, rarely or never. Um, one, I, or it's this is a different point. I would say this is specific to this to this thing, to the valuability, um, is uh, that for example on GitHub, because we talked about Git before they have this like punch card thingy, right? This calendar of contributions. And the problem there is that they count uh, commits, they count issue opens, they count pull requests. Don't count anything else. What I do mostly is comments on issues like design feedback. They do not count this at all. So, I mean, I also do open issues and I also do commit, but if I wouldn't do that, I would be invisible. So uh, this is basically, uh, um, I mean, as GitHub says on the front page, built for developers. So um, that's like the first uh, mistake that is made there. Um, the, uh, this is interesting. The answer by the book uh, is at the beginning. I actually think the ideation process, it should be happening all across because the idea you're going to be learning, you're learning all the time through the process of designing and developing. So that should feed into ideation. That doesn't mean that at specific stages you might focus more on that than on building, for example, or whatever. But I think it should be there all along. I think it's a, a, a very wide pipeline um, in a lot of ways. So, I mean, in the end, and the first thing you have to know is everything about your user you can. Uh, what are their goals? What is this going to achieve for them? You have a person as a product specialist who's listening to a, u a user researcher determine what the most opportunity is, doing a ton of math with BAs to figure out what it looks like. Um, and if, if you're an open source project and you're, it's a project of passion, you're like, okay, does this achieve the goal better than all the other options? And that takes a lot of time and effort and energy. Um, uh, sometimes you'll choose a design because it's easier to communicate. And that requires uh, basically sketching out what the visual design is, going down to sketching and different pieces. It, it's it's a incredibly variable depending on what product you're building, what who your users are, how complex it is, if you have a marketplace versus a single use app, like what what's going on here. Um, so it's there's not a single standard way to integrate design in or, organization, um, but it it's definitely an important piece for every piece to understand the value of. And uh, again, it really depends on what you say design is. So just from experience, I can say for me, it was always from the very beginning, forever, constantly. Basically, I always, as a programmer, I'm constantly designing actually the software, and that includes both the like the twelve-person team writing computer games and uh, my single-person projects at home that I do. Uh, it's always constantly thinking, oh, I could do maybe this better. Or maybe I could do, and then I just write down the idea, and then later on I try to, you know, read through the, some of the things I wrote down and work on them. Can I, anything else? I'll change the question. 
Okay. Um, okay, so the next question is, as a contributor, have you ever felt technically shamed? By myself all the time. <laughs> Say that again. By myself all the time. <laughs> Why did I write this? What? <laughs> so stupid. Oh, that was me again. I think that's a thing developers do. I've seen that answer. You know, I've seen yeah, this in so many that's developers. From them. Um, I, I don't really feel shame. I feel I can say, oh, gee, I did this wrong, but I don't really. I'm shamed about it. <laughs> I mean, we call it blaming, shaming, but we don't really think of it as that. <laughs> Uh, teaching is hard and like uh, ad, ad learning is uh, basically getting used to embarrassment and just moving forward with it and uh, having a culture that supports basically feeling shamed and getting better and like using that to move forward and not uh, make you feel like you need to stay in your lane and hide is a, is a different uh, environment and I think it's important to design organizations so that identifying when the shame is and then saying okay well if you're gonna call me on this you need to teach it to me and let's sit down and actually get over this because we can't have this happen over and over again because that's, that's, where, that's, where, that's where the organization should be ashamed. <laughs> the thing is that it also depends on the project. So uh, if you're a beginner designer and you might propose something that is outrageous and the developer might say, no, this is, will never be implemented. So, or how did you not know that uh, this is not implementable and can be a bit uh, down for the designer because he will lose confidence in him. But I don't say that we should always say that, oh, that's nice and that's beautiful. But uh, yeah, and this applies not, not only for designers, but also for new contributors. So one thing for new contributors, always check first whether what you're gonna try to do actually makes sense. So just ask what needs doing. Like if you come to a project and you say, oh, I made this complete brand new design that for your project and it's going to be great, everybody's going to look at you like, why? Uh, so, yeah. uh, just a, a comment on this, but um, as you mentioned also, uh, the open source community is very focused on uh, uh, kind of a technical elitism and uh, you know you were recognized by your contribution and uh, I know that from uh, I was in for them some years ago and there was a similar discussion with people working on documentation and translation that are another kind of contribution and it's very hard to enter a community and very hard to to be recognized if you're not a developer basically and so putting some uh, insights or in some way to to show that the value that uh, a designer, uh, uh, someone who works on documentation can provide to a community. I, I think it's very important and shifting a little bit the focus on uh, our developers and developing and uh, code only to something more broad, user experience uh, uh, is something that is probably, in my, in my opinion, something that should be valued and probably be pushed in some way. So, uh, There is just one thing I want to add to that. I mean, as a developer, if you can write use cases for me, if you can uh, like basically make my work easier in any way, that's ridiculously appreciated. You cannot imagine the amount. Like it won't always show, maybe, <laughs> but it really usually is very appreciated if you do any kind of work that organizes work for me in a way. So if it makes my work more efficient, more organized, more clear what the issue is, even just going over issues in the back tracker and uh, asking users what, you know, what's the actual problem here, or why is this not working, what's your system, stuff like that hugely helps. Okay, so the next question is, uh, should open source designers have an engineering background? For, for me, I have an engineer. I have a master in software engineering, and instead of coding, I decided to do interaction design, <laughs> and it was helpful <laughs> uh, because I know how to commit and to develop, and I understand. But uh, can you explain what you mean by background? That's background, I mean academic. Yes, okay. yes, like. Uh, I'm gonna say no. Uh, but definitely not. And I also think that designers don't need to have an, an academic design background. You 
you know. It's sometimes you learn on the job. Sometimes you, you know. Um, I think the academic background is somehow irrelevant. <laughs> I think it's useful if you're trying to communicate with engineers. So if you're designing open source tools for engineers, I mean, you're going to, it's basically user research you have. Yeah, I was also going to say most, so I definitely agree with the ac academic part. You don't need academics. But it's sometimes even bad for you. Uh, no, 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 not really, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, like learning in practice on projects is always better than five minutes left. Ooh. <laughs> um, um, oh, lost my thought, sorry. I, I did want to say that, yeah, usually it is good to have the background so that you know whether your ideas are easier to implement or not. Because if you can come up with a great design that is just unfeasible to implement and then it's kind of wasted effort. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, for this question and for the previous one, uh, a question came to my mind. Actually, I heard uh, always the uh, communication between designers and developers, but uh, why we don't uh, talk about analysts? Uh, for example, uh, for use case diagrams or flows, uh, they can be also from uh, an engineering background and I think that the analyst position would be so helpful for such projects. Uh, so my question is, uh, in general, are there also analysts for your, during your projects or you communicate directly uh, to the developers? Thank you. So again, depends on the size of the project. If they have uh, analysts, that would, it's already a big project. And uh, some of the analyst work is done by the interaction designers or um, at the place we had the most successful product I've ever seen, we actually used to get them out of BA. So BA would do a lot of the, the sales talk and the, the number crunching, and then we would transition the ones usually with humanities backgrounds into product and design work. And it, we, we had extreme success with them. They were literally the best I've ever worked with in my career. Can you so, explain BA? Um, business analyst, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next question is, would you trust the designer to make the best decision for your project? And there is a tweet from Nelson who says that um, uh, <laughs> since the merit system in project is based on contribution, why would you trust this new and unknown person to start making decisions about how the thing should work? So any comments on that? Definitely depends on the designer. Uh, has a background in engineering, right? No, mo mostly about whether I think they are, Aww. you know. Uh, seriously, though, I would say the design speaks for itself always. So it, it doesn't matter who it is. If the arguments are there for why this design is good, then sure. But it has to be merit-based. It cannot be, oh, I like this new, I don't know, uh, the material design, and I think it's the best thing ever. So I'm, we're now going to switch everything to material design. That doesn't, that's useless, basically. It's a fashion statement. I think it's kind of ridiculous to think you can even upfront know what the best decision is. All you can do is make an informed decision, and designers are more than capable of making a well-informed decision. Um, I, w I would say, especially since uh, Andreas, the person who wrote the tweet as a designer also, uh, might be like a devil's advocate question. So I don't think he thinks that uh, it's correct or proper that there's a merit system in open source software. Um, yeah, I don't know what his actual opinion is. Um, but yeah. I think trust needs to be earned. So um, if you're a designer, you need to earn the trust of the community uh, and they, maybe they'll believe that yours is the best decision. <laughs> <There's a plan. laughs> okay, the next st statement is that everyone has an opinion on design. And there's also a tweet commenting that um, it's, really, it's really hard getting buying from project maintainers. It could take six plus months back and forth to get the logo designed. Any questions? Any remarks? From my side, I, always, I also always have opinions, but I always try to hold them back if they are just opinions. 
So you, you have to always think of the bigger project and the whole user base, not just your own use case. I think my leg of the elephant is awesome. <laughs> if you guys haven't heard about the the elephant thing, it's you know the wise men with like one person's t uh, touching the trunk, and it's like oh it's a snake. One person's touching <laughs> the leg. It's oh it's a tree. I don't know. Uh, there's other places you can touch. It's a very different experience. Um, but in the end, the way that you know what it is is by everyone having a piece of it. So if you have a, uh, something that serves more than one kind of user, um, they're going to each have a lens into it. Um, so, for example, like there's lots of stuff out there not designed for me. So, I guess I, everyone has an opinion, but mostly it's their lens that they have their experience in. Mm, I mean, I would definitely say everyone has an opinion on design, but uh, it depends how you um, put them into words and how you argue them and how you uh, back them with research or with with uh, results or not results, but yeah, research or. or um, only research, I guess, user testing and stuff. Uh, how it, uh, how they, how they then end up in the project, or how uh, you get value out of them, because anyone can say anything, uh, and uh, yeah, it cannot be informed by any anything that makes sense. But if you actually do testing and research, which unfortunately is uh, not often thought about, then uh, you can actually do that. Just, just wait for the Twitter ratio. <laughs> okay. Next question is uh, with a like, summary, but what do you think is the greatest attribute a novice designer should have? And we're going to see other results and comment on that. Okay, so communication Style. skill. <laughs> Swagger. You like so much again? Mm -hmm. I would have expectations. I what is think it? That, that oh, would be the yeah, I would have, I, so I would have also said that, but whatever. <laughs> I think you're always limited by what you're worst at. <laughs> and the last question, because we're a bit late, is um, do you think, th is there any correlation between gender and noise participation? And I have some stats there that in UK, it's a stat from 2014, 70% of design students are female, and the participation open source of women is 3%. And also, if you look at in the room and, and the contributors in our small community, there are more, many more females than... 3% is a lot, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, just being kind of honest about IT right now. Yeah, I also have some stats, and the, and like there's been a study a couple of years ago where they found out that um, a code done by women, code done by women is uh, approved at a higher rate than men, unless the gender is known, and if the gender is known, it just goes downhill from there. So, and to think that this issue is not systematic is just to like turn a blind eye into that. So there's definitely a correlation, and we kind of know why that is. Also speaking about the numbers, as far as I know, the general participation in the developer community of women is about 12 or 14 percent, something like this. So three percent. Yeah. Of course. You read and the data. But yeah, but three percent seems lower than <laughs> general industry. So I also find six, five depends on again. And we're ranging 1 to 11 percent, but not higher than that, depending on the community. Uh, in develop, like general development, uh, not open source, it's 25 percent max. So that's already a big difference. But 3 percent is more close to the, to the truth, like of total open source participants. I would be very skeptical about, I mean, those results, we have to wonder which jobs did they, you know, count in those statistics. I actually don't. I mean, it, uh, we definitely have huge salary gaps still, uh, power gaps. Um, I mean, you see different, like, uh, even when they fix the pay ratio, they don't necessarily fix the bonus ratio or um, how many, what percentage get promoted. Um, you, you see in computer science especially has the most, um, basically you have people leaving the field that are women and minority at a higher pace than your, your white guy coming in. So you actually have a survival rate that drops. Um, that says that there's a reason they're leaving, 
Uh, what that is, there's a lot of research there. A lot of it is bad environments and bad systems. Um, making sure that when you design your community and your open source product and your governance to make sure that this is comfortable and, and if, if you're like me, which is a white male uh, American, you look, go, okay, if I want this person to contribute, what do they need to feel safe, valued, um, and honestly can afford to go? and afford to participate. And those are going to be different answers depending on what country you're talking about, what gender, and what, what you look like. So thank you so much for participating and for answering and for the questions. So yes, thank, thank you. Kathy. <laughs> thank you.